Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And today we're going to look at a range of education issues in Florida, from a tax referendum to increased teacher pay to mobile phones and devices in schools and a lot more. Our guest today is Hillsborough County School Board member Jessica Vaughn. Welcome back to Tuesday Cafe, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always an honor to be here. I'm so glad that you could join us. So we've got a lot to talk about in this hour, and let's start with mobile devices, electronic devices. Last week, the Hillsborough School Board continued its discussion about its mobile phone policy. So what are the problems in schools that the policy is trying to solve? Oh, goodness. Um, well, you know, essentially, I would say, obviously, there's distraction, right, during instructional time, if it's not needed for class, you know, scrolling social media, not paying attention. But then on top of it, there's kind of this added element of bullying each other or using social media to target each other. Um, so it's kind of a twofold problem where it's distracting from instructional time. And it's also kind of fostering an environment where, you know, there's more negative energy going towards each other when it comes to students or other faculty members. So it's really become a big problem in our schools. What is the school district's current policy when it comes to devices like smartwatches, earbuds, and mobile phones? So our current policy is pretty vague. I mean, it does say that it should be turned off and put away. Um, it says, you know, if you violate that policy, your phone might be taken away. But it's really been used more up to the discrepancy of each individual school. And each individual school has kind of fostered their own policy, which has been confusing, especially if students have switched schools and they were used to one policy. So um, I know at the board level, we want to make put more teeth in it, make it more unified, make it more clear for families and schools schools and everyone. So that's where the new proposed policy comes from. And you are, um, some, some of the board members want a complete ban on mobile phones at schools, but you're not one of those. No, I mean, I think it's a really delicate issue because for the most part, unfortunately, I feel like, mo and, and obviously it's not all across the board, but most of our staff members, our teachers, our administrators, they really see the value in the cell or the mobile device um, ban, whereas parents feel a little more anxiety around it. Um, you know, they want to be able to have access to their student in case there's emergency. Sometimes they support their students just kind of helping them stay organized or they want to be able to keep in touch with them. So there's a lot of anxiety from our families around this policy. Policy. Um, and I have to represent both. So I try to bring in both sides of the, the perspective when we're discussing this policy. So the discussion last Tuesday and others, where are we kind of headed perhaps with, with the uh, where the policy might end up? So the, the most recent version of the policy, which if people want to take a look at it before we vote on it in July, um, we have all our agendas online and it was included in the last agenda. So people can actually go on board docs from our website and look it up. But essentially it says that for every time that a student's in school, that the device, whatever device they have, that means smartwatches, cell phones, if there's any other kind of electronic device, needs to be um, put on silent and put away in their backpacks throughout the day. Now, there are exceptions for that. If a teacher gives you um, authorization to use it for instructional time or the assignment, or I know that there are some schools where you can earn mobile device time as kind of part of their um, positive behavior reinforcement plan. Um, so you can use it in those situations. Or if there's a medical emergency, if you know, it, it monitors your blood sugar and it alerts your family or something like that, or if it's even built into your IEP or your 504, then you can make an allowance for the electronic device. So there are different approaches to banning electronic devices in classrooms. You mentioned some of them, like they have to be turned off or they have to be stored in lockers or not bringing them to school at all. So it sounds like you're kind of leaning toward the device might be with the student most of the time, but it has to be silent, which means that people can still get alerts. The kids can still get alerts, but uh, they, they just can't interact with them unless it's a situation in which it's allowed. And but in between classes, maybe they could use them or at lunchtime. There's no there's no allowances for that in the cell phone policy as of right now. And they shouldn't be on the students. So while they'll be on silent, they should be in their backpacks and put away. So even if they get a notification, it shouldn't be disruptive. Now, again, one of the questions I'm going to ask when we actually vote on the policy, because last week we essentially just allowed it to be published in the newspaper so that when we go to vote on the policy, everyone's had an opportunity to know that we're bringing this policy forward. Um, but one of the questions that I'll ask again is, 
if there's, you know, aside from instructional time, if the school has allowances for students to earn access to their mobile devices, like we mentioned with, you know, okay, you've done great all week at lunch, you know, here's a, here's one area where students can use it, if that's going to be built in and allowed in the policy. I still have some questions about it going forward, so I hope next month to get those answers before we vote on it. How is enforcement happening right now? Uh, are there problems with enforcement? And is are is this one of the things that you're trying to kind of solve with the uh, with getting a new policy? I would say absolutely, yes. Um, you know, it's one thing to kind of, when you're an administrator and you're trying to enforce no cell phones or no electronic devices in your schools, to point to our current policies. But again, if there's a school down the street that does it differently and parents are used to that, then there's some question about where that enforcement comes from. Now, I think with such a stronger policy at the district level, that's very clear that we've discussed, it will be more clear across the board what our expectations are. Now, again, enforcing that in schools is a challenge, right? We're definitely putting more responsibility. If there's a school who hasn't really seen a need for it, and this is going to be a newer policy, kind of rolling that out and enforcing it is going to be a challenge. So we have kind of talked about this. Is this going to put more burden on our educators? What is that going to look like? But I can say overall, the feedback that I've gotten from our employees is it doesn't matter. We want this policy. Cell phones are causing such a problem in our schools. And there's a difference between high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. Can you lay that out as well, please? And so not in this policy, there isn't. I was hoping for something like that, because again, I know that some of the feed that we've gotten is in middle and high school. Can the students use it, like you said, in cl passing classes or in between periods? Um, and the policy as written doesn't make um, any kind of uh, um, extreme certain, it's an allowances for that. It doesn't allow for that. Um, I think that there should be more allowances for that. Um, but again, it doesn't seem like that's the will of the board. So as of, as written right now, the policy doesn't contain that. Our guest is Hillsborough County School Board member Jessica Vaughn, and we're speaking about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canaan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF. And I want to read a little bit about a Pew Research Center survey that came out recently. It found the majority of teachers view cell phones as a distraction, but they say that enforcing a ban is difficult. And of course, this isn't Hillsborough County. This is across the whole country. And perhaps unsurprisingly, students in this Pew Research Center survey found that cell phones aren't so bad in schools. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details of that survey, but uh, are you familiar with it and, and any thoughts about this? Yeah, I did just see that came out recently within the last few days. Um, and I'm it does mirror other than, you know, um, I do think our uh, our employees are, have concerns about enforcing it. But again, I think that even though there are concerns, they see the value in taking them away because they've caused so much disruption. And absolutely, I mean, we have student forums, um, you know, once a year where we really get a good feedback from our middle and high school students, and they were very opposed to this policy. So I think it's going to cause a lot of anxiety. I mean, I don't think families and students love it. But again, I think our employees are really asking for it. And, you know, I think overall, it's the trend that we see happening, not only in Florida, but across the country. Um, and I think it's good. It's a value to see if it makes a difference in our schools. Have there been uh, similar bans in the past? I'll say bans. I know it's not a complete ban, but have the, the, the district has probably tried to enact this before. And then there have been problems and reversals. Give us a little bit of history of that, please. That actually hasn't happened since I've been on the board. So I've been on the board almost four years in November. Um, I'm not sure previous to that. I think we had a pretty loose, like I said, I think our original cell phone policy has been in place. And, and now is the time where we're really moving towards that because, you know, mobile devices have become such a part of our everyday life. So I'm not familiar with any controversy or trying it before. I think that this is kind of the test ground and the movement on that. Moving back to the Pew survey, here's more of what they found. 72% of U.S. high school teachers say cell phone distraction is a major problem in the classroom, and that's compared with 33% of middle school teachers and 6% of elementary school teachers. One-third of public K-12 through teachers say that students being distracted by cell phones is a major problem in the classroom, and another 20% say it's a minor problem. So a lot of high school teachers fewer middle school teachers and only 6% of elementary school teachers say that it's a problem. 
actually, I got a lot different feedback um, when we first rolled this out and we talked about it at a workshop and I was a little more aggressive about putting some more caveats in for different grades. Um, I got a lot of feedback from elementary school um, teachers in general that really want cell phones out of the classroom, I was surprised. Um, and we also did our own survey. We did an internal survey with families and teachers. And, you know, overwhelmingly, again, teachers across the board, obviously high school and middle school more, but said that they saw the value in the, you know, removing mobile devices out of our classrooms. Parents were a little bit less. I think it was like 50 or 60% of parents who engage. But, you know, surveys are the people who are, feel passionate about it. So you're going to get more feedback from people who engage in surveys. You know, removing electronic devices that the students would bring to school, that's not the same as having no technology in the classroom, is it? Oh, absolutely not. No, we really used the money that we got from all of our ESSERS funding to really be aggressive about technology. That's how the previous superintendent really outlined it. So we have one-to-one -one devices in almost all of our schools. We have new, um, really amazing smart boards in our classes. We're adding audio um, to our classrooms where teachers can basically broadcast through a mic what's going on. They can actually even translate. Students have um, headphones. So we've been very aggressive about updating our technology and we have focused on that here in Hillsborough County. Wrapping up the information I have from that Pew survey, they also surveyed students and seven in 10 teenagers aged 13 to 17 say there are generally more benefits than harms to people their age using smartphones. And 45% of the teens say smartphones make it easier for people their age to do well in school compared to 23% who say they make it harder. And another 30% say smartphones don't affect teens' su su uh, success, that is, in school. So uh, very different point of view from the students versus the teachers and, and maybe even the parents of how they feel about the use of mobile phones in schools. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I mentioned, I think the students are very attached to that and I do see value in it. I think we should listen to our students. Um, but at the same time, firsthand, you can walk into a school and you can see how distracting the electronic devices are. Um, and so, you know, our number one priority has got to be making sure that we have as much engagement as our instructional time as possible. Um, and yeah, as a school board, we really have to honor that. I would say that I encourage anyone listening who feels passionate, whether they're an employee, whether they're a concerned citizen, whether they're a student, or whether they're a parent, to really engage with us over this policy. Um, you know, you can email the school board members about it. You can come to our meetings, which are, you know, at 4 p.m. on Tuesdays and give public comment. I personally like as much community feedback as possible when I'm making these decisions. So, again, if any of the listeners feel passionate, I really encourage them to engage with the school board before we vote on this, which I believe is July 26th at our Tuesday board meeting. And so if on July 26th this passes, it will go into effect in the upcoming school year, which begins August 12th. Is that right? It's July 23rd. Sorry, I reviewed my calendar. It's July 23rd. Um, absolutely. Yes. And it will really be rolled out in the new school year. That's why we wanted to bring it across in during the summer. So when the new school year starts, there's no question about it. We can roll it out with uniformity um, and be very aggressive about making sure everybody understands the policy. And we've been talking about Hillsborough County so far. I want to mention just so our listeners know what is happening in Pinellas and, and you know, uh, okay. Um, so I have Pinellas uh, at my fingertips right now. Maybe you can uh, let update me on, on PASCO in just a second. But in, in Pinellas, board members unanimously approved a policy that creates a standard set of guidelines for all students in the school district. It's set to take effect in August. This is from Spectrum News. The, the new policy says that elementary school students must keep phones and other similar devices in the off position and stored away during the school year. Phones can be used as soon as the day concludes to coordinate transportation. For middle school students in Pinellas County, they have the same guidelines as elementary schools, but they can also use their phones before school. High school students can leave their phones on silent, but may only use them before and after school during lunch and when transitioning between classes. Phones cannot be used in ways that violate academic integrity in restrooms, locker rooms, or swimming areas. Photos or video recordings cannot be taken while at school without prior consent. And Pinellas County did a survey of 8,000 students, parents, and teachers before they arrived at this policy. So that information comes from Spectrum News. Um, so compare and contrast perhaps what you're considering in Hillsborough with what has passed in Pinellas County. 
Yeah. So our policy does not allow for students to use it um, again without teacher or administrator approval for the curriculum or something specific throughout the day. So that means even after this, basically anytime they're on the property, other than like, you know, an extracurricular event, sporting event or whatnot, they're not able to access their phone unless they've gotten permission from a teacher or administrator. So it is definitely more strict than Pinellas. But again, in Pasco, um, I want to say maybe six months ago, I'm not really sure of the timeline, you know, they they in introduced a ban on electronic devices at all. From my understanding, you can't even bring it to school. So theirs was way more way more restrictive. So it's interesting that Hillsborough is kind of going to be in the middle of the two. And, and we can always make amendments to our policies as they roll out. So if we find that this policy isn't working or the feedback isn't great or we want to model ours after Pinellas or we want to be more restrictive, that's the great thing is we can always make changes to our policy. Our guest is Hillsborough County School Board Jessica Vaughn, and we're speaking about education issues in Florida, including whether or not to, that mobile devices will be allowed in schools. I'm Sean Canaan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We can wrap up that part of the discussion and begin talking about a tax proposal that will be on the ballot in November in Hillsborough County. Uh, for example, last Friday, the T Tampa Tiger Bay Club held a discussion about that proposed new property tax to boost teacher pay. It will be on Hillsborough County ballots in November, but the Tampa Bay Times is reporting that Tampa Tiger Bay struggled to find panelists who oppose it. You do you support this tax. Why is that? Oh, well, I mean, I understand how what a challenge it's been trying to compete with the other counties who have this millage and pay a competitive wage to keep our employees in our schools. I mean, it's as simple as that. So essentially the there's a almost a revenue disadvantage by for not having this tax when all the counties around pretty much have have Absolutely. a penny for yes. Pinellas, things like that. Yes, our, not only our surrounding counties, any counties that are our size and scope, unfortunately have all uh, passed, the, not unfortunately, but you know, it's unfortunate that as a community or as a county, we have to go out for extra funding. You know, it would really be better if the state funded us in a way where we didn't have to self-fund, but absolutely. So it's an extra revenue source. Specifically, the way that we're putting it on the ballot is absolutely just to make sure that we can increase salaries for our for our teachers, but all of our employees, and make sure that they have a livable wage. Um, and when other counties have this supplement and we don't, it doesn't matter how much, you know, out of our funds and revenues that we get from taxes and from the state, if we raise it, if they can always offer this extra amount of, you know, like a supplement or a bonus to re retain or attract our teachers, you know, our county is big enough where it's not that big of a deal to drive over to to Pinellas or Pasco to, you know, make an additional two or $3,000. Again, when our employees are fighting for a livable wage, I mean, if you, if you, if you pay attention, I think we're dead last 50th in the state, as far as our funding that we get for public education. Um, you know, and again, that translates directly to being able to pay our employees who are in the classroom. So for me, this millage is essential. You know, it's interesting that you point out that the state should be adequately funding the education. Well, the Florida Constitution requires that the state adequately fund public education. Yet it sounds like uh, you you might think that it's it isn't happening. Absolutely. I mean, within the past few years, the state has been um, more generous in per pupil allocation, which is the money that they allot us for every student that we have. But there's a lot of complications with that because they've also... Uh, removed other funding sources for categoricals that they've given us. So we have to shift money around to pay for those missing, you know, those missing categoricals monies that we used to get, um, as well as with student choice expanding, if we have less students in our school, even if we raise the pure pupil money, if we're losing 8,000 students every year, that's less money being generated. Um, and on top of that, you know, now we're being a little more aggressive per, per, per pupil funding, but, you know, for 10 or 12 years, we didn't have any, any raise in that per pupil funding. So even if we're starting to catch up now, it's been a deficit for years and years and years. So we're so far behind that even these small increment, incremental allocations isn't getting us anywhere where we need to be. And we'll talk more about the idea that students might not be choosing public education as frequently now as they have been. We'll get to that later in the show. I want to continue to talk about this tax that's on the November ballot. Um, so 
this the proposed tax will be one do, $1 assessment for every $1,000 in assessed property value. It's the kind of uh, arrangement that, as you mentioned, exists in a lot of Florida districts already. But a similar ballot measure was rejected by voters in Hillsborough County two years ago. So how would you compare the political mood right now to then and uh, whether this tax has a chance of passing in November? Well, I think it's challenging, right, because we have inflation that's gone up. So it's harder for people to commit to, you know, an additional tax, especially our homeowners, especially our homeowners on fixed incomes, um, which I think is is a huge challenge. There's so much anxiety about the economy right now. However, I also think that we've done a much better job in one, instilling trust and transparency around what this looks like and why we need it. Um, I think our messaging messaging is better. I think it's more clear on the ballot exactly what it's what it's going to be used for and how important it is. And I also think that within those two years, a lot of people have seen their favorite teachers, their favorite media center specialists, their favorite ESE para, unfortunately have to leave our county or leave education altogether because they can't afford to do the job. And now that I think it's impacting our families in very real way ways, they see the value in it. And I also think our employees see the value in it. So I think, you know, at the time, there was a lot of stuff going on. We were right in the midst of really extreme culture wars happening. And, you know, we really barely lost. I think it was less than 600 votes that that wasn't approved by. So I'm extremely hopeful this time it's going to pass. I want to remind people that our guest is Hillsborough County School Board member Jessica Vaughn. We're speaking about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we're talking right, right now about the November ballot initiative in Hillsborough County to increase property taxes by a mill in order to pay for education. The Tampa Bay Times estimates that it would uh, make about it would generate about one hundred seventy seven million dollars a year in revenue. Does that sound about what you've heard? And how would that money be spent? Yeah, I've heard that it's been anywhere from 160 to 180, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and the superintendent has been very clear that he wants to give, I believe, a $4,000 supplement to every single one of our teachers and instructional staff. And I I want to say a $2,000 supplement to um, our support staff, you know, that looks like our pairs and our ESE, our cafeteria workers, our other support staff who are not supporting in the classroom directly with instructional every single day. Um, now, I believe that 90% of that is going to go towards it, towards um, a salaries, and I think there's 10% that we will have a little flexibility with as far as making sure that we, you know, expand all of the programs that people really like, whether it's making sure that we keep all of the arts in our schools or some other things, but almost, I believe, 90% from the last time the superintendent talked about the funding is going to go directly to our employees' salaries. And we talked earlier that the other day there was a Tampa Tiger Bay Club meeting about this tax and that of the five panelists, only one person, that's Temple Terrace City Council member Allison Fernandez, opposes it. She wants, and this is according to the Tampa Bay Times, she wants the school district to perform a full and comprehensive financial analysis to find where you're spending on redundant contracts, where you have superfluous administration downtown, and where you're staffing schools in the wrong locations before I would ever agree to a new tax. That was a quote from Allison Fernandez with Temple Terrace City Council. What are your thoughts on those critiques of how the school district spending the money? I find them to be disingenuous if you've really paid attention to our school board meetings and how aggressive we've been around any contract that comes before us, asking questions, finding the value in it. We absolutely have been very aggressive to make sure that we have the right unit allocation at every single school, you know, doing attendance reports repeatedly to make sure that we're not over allocating. Um, there's been great downsizing when it comes to district staff and what that looks like, and sometimes even to a detriment, you know, sometimes this positions have been really needed and people are scrambling to fill in the duties of what that looks like. I mean, I, I really feel like we've been cut down to the bone and we've been very reflective and responsive to that. You know, hopefully, fingers crossed, we might be 
finishing negotiations when it comes to our teachers and our employees' salaries right now. And that will be unprecedented to have that done before the school year even starts, you know? So we're really trying to use every penny that we can to make sure that we're using it purposefully. Um, and I think that's been very clear if you've watched our board meetings where we at nauseum talk about almost every single penny that we're spending. So um, again, I, I, I don't find value in that statement. Let's talk about teacher vacancies right now. I was reading in the Tampa Bay Times that the teachers union president says that there are more than 1,000 instructional vacan vacancies in Hillsborough County, but district officials say that they're focusing on about 400 positions that they'd like to fill based on projected student enrollment. What can you say about those numbers and about teacher vacancies in Hillsborough County in general? Well, again, you know, vacancies is one of the number one things that we talk about. It's a one of our biggest issues. Um, you know, recently within the last year or so, we've hired uh, Dr. Patton, who's come to our HR team, and she's been really great and really aggressive about looking at recruiting and what that looks like. But vacancies is a huge problem. If we don't have teachers in our classrooms educating our students with the curriculum, um, test scores are going to suffer. The quality of education is going to suffer. Um, and if we're losing them to surrounding counties or if we're losing them because of the fact that they can't make a livable wage, they can't teach in the county that they, you know, that where they live, that's a huge problem. Um, now, of course, there are other factors, you know, again, we could talk about those later, you know, cultural war support of what it looks like of why people are losing, edu leaving education. But when we do an analysis, a lot of the times we're losing them to surrounding counties or other occupations where they can just make more money. Um, so I know that what we've been really aggressive about is focusing on filling the the, the positions one in our in our transformation schools and our Title I schools that are in marginalized communities where unfortunately a lot of times they end up with substitute teachers and we want to make sure that you know we have you know, the best, most qualified teachers in front of our students who need the most support, as well as we're really looking at our ESE positions. That's been a, a place where we've had a hard time keeping our staff. And again, those are our most fragile kids, right? Our kids that need the most support. Um, so I know specifically at the school board level and, and down throughout the superintendent's cabinet and district staff, we've spent a lot of time looking at getting those positions staffed. We're talking about this tax that's going to be on the November ballot that would increase the millage rate for uh, for um, homeowners or, or property owners, and it would it would create revenue for schools in Hillsborough County. The same during the same election, voters in Hillsborough will, will be presented with the county's community investment sales tax, which includes some money for school construction. So, uh, do you see this as a, a potential conflict or problem where people will either be concerned and not either that there are a couple of taxes that they're voting on or even be confused about the two? Any thoughts or any guidance you can give Hillsborough County voters on these two different taxes? Absolutely. I, I do. I am concerned and I am worried. And unfortunately, you know, this CIT tax is nothing new, it's been in effect. For years and years and years, um, it's time for the county commission within the next two years to renew it. So they're being aggressive about that. Unfortunately, it's cut the percentage down to the schools um, quite significantly from the percentage that we had previously. Um, but I, I think one of the most important things is, you know, we have a lot of different budgets, but our two most important budgets at the school district is our general fund. And that's where, you know, 80 to 90 percent of our salaries come from. And that's where the half uh, percent millage will come from, will generate not come from but it will generate revenue and then we have our capital outlay budget and the capital outlay budget the two are are not are interchangeable they're separate budgets and that's where we get the funding for roofs and turf and air conditioning and the actual physical pieces and as you mentioned building our schools the actual physical pieces of the school and so this CIT tax is specifically earmarked for that. It doesn't affect teacher salaries, but it makes sure that we can do the expansion, especially in East, East County, where a lot of the growth is happening, to make sure that we can properly build schools and the infrastructure needed in those areas. So there are two separate issues. The one for the, for the millage is specifically for employee salaries, and the one for the CIT tax is to make sure that we can expand physically in the locations that we need to. I hope Maybe. that clarifies. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Many of the people voting in Hillsborough County in November either don't have any kids at all or they don't have kids in the school system. Why should they support taxes to support to to benefit schools? 
That's a great question. Um, first of all, even if you don't have kids directly in the school system, Hillsborough County Schools is the largest employee in our county, or employer in our county, right? So usually everybody has a friend, a cousin, an uncle, somebody who teaches in our school district or gets their revenue from our school district. So, you know, making sure that we're supporting our biggest employer in the county is important. Um, also, most people have someone in the school system. It may not be your child, but it's your grandchild. It's someone that you care about who's in public school and you want to make sure that they have access to, to the best education. And number three, these are the people who are going to be leading us. You know, these the, the, our children are literally our future. Um, and if we're not prioritizing their education, that says a lot about our community, our society. You know, education is the biggest equalizer in societies. It's the biggest, um, you know, earmark of whether our kids are going to be successful. I mean, education, if you look at everything, comes down to education. So prioritizing to make sure that we have great public schools in our community is a benefit to everybody, whether you directly have kids in our schools or not. And you may have kids in school, but they might not be in a public school. They might be in a private school or charter school. And that number is increasing, the, the number of people coming out of the traditional public schools and going into other for, forms of education. So how might that affect the chances of this tax passing? Well, number one, charter schools are included in this, right? Because they are public schools. They're not traditional public schools. You know, they've always gotten traditional, I mean, they've always gotten public funding, whether it's taxes, they get a percentage of anything that we pass. They're just managed by a private board. So that's how they differ from traditional public schools. As far as um, private schools, I haven't seen any allowance for that as far as them getting any piece of this. So that will be a different conversation. But again, um, whether you, whatever you choose, whether it's, you know, you know, somebody who works for our school district or you have, you know, a relative that goes to our school district, again, making sure whatever your choice is, we have strong public schools, um, I think is imperative to our community, period. Our guest is Hillsborough County School Board member Jessica Vaughn, and we're talking about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. We'll switch gears right now to talk about book bans. Um, you know, I know the governor doesn't like that term, um, but what what do you have to say about that term of book bans? And and maybe we can start it all off with maybe the most absurd headline that people have read lately. For example, in the Guardian, it, the the headline was "Book about book bans banned by Florida school board," and that was about the book called "Ban This Book" by Alan Gratz. It was banned in Indian River County because of opposition from parents linked to Moms for Liberty. So. Uh, wide open subject. What What are your thoughts about that? Oh, goodness. Well, I think that for me, um, I can't speak to other counties, right? Every other county is kind of a microcosm and it has to reflect its community. But here in Hillsborough County, what we have focused on as a school board has been very specific in what our policies look like. Um, we want to make sure that every that each community is really making the decision for them because Hillsborough County is huge. You know, um, it's the third largest county in all Florida and we're the seventh largest district in the entire nation. So our 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 schools are all microcosms and they look very different. So our process is very specific. If a parent wants to pull a book or has concerns about it, they put in a book challenge specifically at that school. Now, let me be clear. The second they put in the book challenge, that book is removed from the shelves. So it doesn't stay on the shelves. So it is removed until we have a process. The local school media specialist uh, already has an entire committee of parents teachers, um, uh, students, um, community members who then review that book, they read it, they talk about the merits, they vote on whether they want to keep it into their schools, then um, just regardless of what, of what they think, if the person who challenges it doesn't like the outcome, they can challenge it at the district level, then we have a whole committee of district people along with the PTA, along with students who are experts in the field who review that book, they review the statues, they see if there's value in keeping it in the school, they vote on it. Now, Again, if the person challenging it doesn't like the votes of those two committees, it comes to the school board where we have a, a, a discussion about it. We vote on it. And then even then, if the person challenging the book isn't happening, they can challenge it all of the way up to the state and the state assigns a magistrate and they vote on the book. So for me, and I think my fellow school board members, whether we agree with the book or not, it's very important to make sure that each school and each community 
has that ability to have a thoughtful discussion through the committee and make recommendations. And I can tell you that for me as a school board member, unless something drastic happens, I'm always going to honor what the two committees before me decide, because I think that's really important. Um, so we've been very, very stringent about keeping that those policies in place and allowing each individual school to really have input and make those decisions. So that's where we are in Hillsborough County. And what we, we've talked during this interview kind of a lot about how public school enrollment is going down. And uh, what do you think some of the reasons are for that? It's uh, school enrollment, public school enrollment in Florida is not increasing as fast as population growth is. For example, in Flagler County, the Tampa Bay Times is telling us that officials say the expansion of state funded education options is the key reason why in Flagler, um, what about here in Hillsboro and other other parts of the state? Yeah, um, I think that there's a lot of concerns about what's being taught in schools, right? And I, I do believe, like, again, to reference the culture wars, that um, whatever side you're on in these culture wars, there's concerns about indoctrination in our school, right? If you're very conservative, people are concerned about what the books are or what ideologies are being taught. If you're more liberal, there's concerns that there is more of a conservative agenda being pushed, whether it's, you know, um, anti-socialist and communist day or teaching kindergartners that communism is bad or whether they're worried about PragerU coming into the schools and more of a conservative. So I think on both sides, people are nervous, especially Especially some of our, you know, um, black and brown communities when there started to be legislation that, you know, talked about um, slavery benefic benefiting black people, black communities. Um, I think that's been problematic and that there are concerns about whether we're whitewashing history even more. So I think with all of these concerns that have kind of been stoked by the culture war and then the expansion of school choice where now you can get a voucher and you can go to a private school and take that if they accept it or you can do homeschooling, people are taking advantage of that. Um, I know that I read an article a few months ago that said, you know, based on the data they could find, Hillsboro has the most homeschool students in the entire state. Um, and so, you know, for every student that makes a choice that is in our traditional public education, you know, that's less money in our budget. That's less money that we have to work with. And that's, you know, a concern. And one of, uh, you know, one of the reasons, unfortunately, that we, again, have to prioritize traditional public education as a community and ask for a millage directly. And one of the side effects of what you're talking about, about this decrease in public school enrollment, is that some schools closed. And so what can you say about Hillsborough County schools that might be closing? And um, what do you think that the role is in, in that of the Florida legislature's push to kind of privatize some education through vouchers and so forth? Yeah, um, it has been incredibly hard to watch those schools close. Um, you know, they all had a community of students that were invested, parents who were invested in those schools. But unfortunately, even though I didn't vote for those school closures, um, I understand why my fellow board members did. You can't, you know, spend a lot of money on schools that have low enrollment. You know, when we're cut to the bone and we're scrutinizing every single penny we have, it's hard to justify salaries for, you know, full staff of, of uh, to keep a school open if, you know, it's at a quarter or a third of the enrollment that's intended. So we've had to make some really hard decisions. And again, watching schools like Kimball or Adams close has been heartbreaking and really hard, but it is, it's the trade-off for school's choice. And the state has been very transparent about that. They've written several, they've given several statements where the articles have been written that essentially say the trade-off for school choice is, you know, the closing and downsizing of traditional public education. Um, and unfortunately, in Hillsborough County, that hurts our marginalized communities the most. Um, you know, we already have an issue where it's hard for a lot of our families who don't necessarily have transportation to come back and invest in their school for extracurricular things, whether it's sports or it's things that, you know, really keep a lot of our students coming to schools. When you look at it, a lot of times they're coming just for that music program or they're coming just to play that sport. And a lot of our families already can't take advantage of that because they live so far away. And when you close a school and you displace them and you put them further away, that gives them less opportunity to, to partake in the community things that that school offers. So it's been it's been very challenging. Earlier, you talked about the culture wars that are happening in Florida. 
Let's let's talk about how in, that's impacting people in schools, especially maybe we can start with transgender students in schools. How are they being impacted by what's happening in Florida? Gosh, um, I mean, not just transgender, but the whole LGBTQ plus community. Um, it has been very challenging. Um, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about what's lo law and what isn't because, you know, there was the don't say gay law, but it's been overturned by some, at some level, you know, um, at the federal court. So understanding what that looks like and what we can do in schools has been an extreme challenge. But I can say that everybody's just scared and the rise of bullying and what it looks like and the negativity and hateful comments and the, you know, has been on the rise since a lot of this, a lot of this legislation has been passed and it's been very painful. We've watched our gay and uh, straight student alliances shrink and have less people to host that, you know, even just putting up a safe space sticker has been controversial and teachers have been afraid to do that. And, you know, making sure that we're fostering safe and inclusive, diverse classrooms has been a real challenge with a lot of this legislation and just the, the hate that's come towards that community specifically. Specifically. The homophobia is just on the rise. Um, and it's it's really concerning because it's not just words. I mean, if you if you take a whole group of people and you demonize them, it's very easy for that to for other people to think it's okay to hurt that community. Um, and it's alarming and it's the antithesis of what we should be doing for not only our students, but we have LGBTQ um, plus employees and we want to make sure everybody feels safe and valued and welcome. So it's been unfortunate to say the least. And a lot of this culture war, uh, these symptoms kind of began well, maybe not began, but kind of were ramped up by this new group that was formed in Florida and is na nationwide called Moms for Liberty. What can you say about the the power and, and uh, the influence of Moms for Liberty in school boards in Hillsborough County and Florida and around the country? Well, you know, it started in Florida, so it was the most aggressive in Florida. So, um, you know, in other districts, I think that we've seen Moms for Liberty really co-opt a lot of our school boards. And unfortunately, a lot of time, not only with just the chaos around the culture wars, it's come with other chaos where they immediately fire the superintendent and then you don't have someone to lead the county. Um, and it, it, it's just caused it a huge amount of chaos within our schools. Um, and when we have fragile schools where people are trying to make choices already about whether they want to put their kids in our traditional public schools and there's any distrust around what's going on in our classrooms. It just excalor, you know, it just makes everything worse. Um, and so it's been a huge issue. Now here in Florida, we've been really, I mean, here in Hillsborough, we've been really lucky so far. Um, we haven't had that influence really in our board. Now this election that's coming up, um, you know, three of um, the school board members out of the four who are challengers, our opponents directly are either being, you know, um, either are in Moms for Liberty or they're being sponsored for Moms for Liberty or Moms for Liberty is helping. So this could be the crucial turning point this election where our board does end up with a majority of Moms for Liberty, depending on who shows up to the poll and how they vote. I guess this Hillsborough County School Board member Jessica Vaughn, and we're speaking about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from WMNF. Let's talk for a second about artificial intelligence, if you don't mind. Um, how is Hillsborough County dealing with the potential for students to use AI on assignments? So that's a really good question. Um, I know that since it's been popping up, we did have some discussion at a, at a workshop about what that looked like and what we're putting in place for that. I know that one of um, my fellow board members, member Gray, has been very concerned and aggressive about that um, and really wants to have a workshop. So we start talking about what that's going to look like. Um, I don't know if that workshop's gotten approved because I think that the timing of it has been challenging. We've had a lot of issues over the summer that we've had to deal with. Um, so I think that's still in flux. And I think we'll know within the next year really what that's going to look like. Let's move on to a policy, a, a law that was created by the Florida legislature signed by Governor DeSantis, allowing armed guardians in, in uh, Florida schools. The Brevard County Sheriff's Office has begun training, training its first group of armed guardians. Is that something you think might be coming to Hillsborough County? I do not think as of right now that's coming to Hillsborough County. I haven't seen any appetite from the board for that. I know there's a lot of concerns 
once you start opening up who has weapons in our schools, um, and it, there's a lot of concern about that, we have a really amazing security team left, led by Chief Newman, who actually, you know, wins awards for kind of modeling what security should look like around the state and our schools to make sure they're safe. Um, so I have not seen that come up. Now, again, when you talk about Moms for Liberty or culture wars, any change on the board of what, the, you know, uh, with it, when it comes for Moms for Liberty could absolutely change that, um, you know, a lot of that is driven by arming teachers or having armed guard our guardians in our schools. That is a priority of Moms for Liberty, as well as whether we're talking about having chaplains in our schools or different things that are coming out of the state legislation. But right now, again, I have not seen that from the current board makeup as anything we're talking about. The Florida legislature has also allowed state uh, to allowed local jurisdictions in the state authority to monitor school zones for speeding. And that includes allowing cameras and fines to keep violators in check. In fact, WJCT is reporting that five Florida school districts will begin to use these cameras on school buses that that uh, monitor that when the stop arm is out to capture video of cars that illegally pass stopped buses. So is this something that Hillsborough County might consider? Yes, we're absolutely participating in that. We've uh, passed several agenda items for what that looks like. We've also, as a board, we were quite aggressive in um, lobbying Tallahassee to make sure that we could have access to those fines and not only have access, but to make sure that we could have the flexibility to use them, not towards just improvements on our bus, but again, also towards our bus driver salaries, because that's one of the critical shortages that we've had. You know, when you have Amazon who can pay their drivers, you know, substantially more than what we can can, making sure that we have uh, drivers to safely support our kids around our, our massive county has been a priority. So absolutely, it's something that we've partnered with the state a lot on and been aggressive to make sure that we have access to that funding. And, you know, I'm not excited about people breaking laws and putting our kids in, in danger, but I am excited that, you know, we'll be able to access some of that funding. What about vaping in schools? Is, is that a problem in Hillsborough County schools? Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's a gigantic problem. And again, one that I really anticipate there's going to be a lot of conversation about in this next year and, and what that looks like. And not even so much the, the feedback isn't necessarily from uh, our employees. It's from the students themselves. We've had quite a few students look at wanting to bring policies forward about vaping, whether it's I think that they now have like vape detectors that you can put in bathrooms specifically and what that looks like and, and letting us know what companies that looks like. Um, you know, when we have our student forums, that's always a gigantic concern. I know if you look at our discipline rates, a lot of it is revolved around vaping and what that looks like. Um, so honestly, yeah, that's something that I feel like is a crisis in our school and that we're going to have to be aggressively looking at how we can mitigate that, that issue. There's been a Hillsborough County public school on the campus of USF Tampa for a while. It's Pizzo K through eight school and it, but it might be looking for a new home um, because the, because USF is looking for higher rent. This is a, according to WUSF and uh, the school's teacher training program with USF is also coming to an end. What is the value of the Pizzo K through eight school and what are the chances of it staying at USF? Oh, this one's a tough one, because <laughs> um, when I was at USF, I did a lot of stuff there um, as a student intern, and I really, I, I love Piso. It's it's my school in my district. Um, yeah, so the rent, uh, I believe, went 10 times more. It was originally around 50000 a year, and now they want to raise it to $500,000 a year. Um, we did sign a, a renewal for 10 years, but because that uh, increases you know, our expenditures so much, I anticipate we have a two-year clause that we're probably going to be looking for other alternatives. I know we've looked at utilizing some of the schools around there that we have closed, whether we were talking about Kimball or Cleveland. It is a K-8, so unfortunately we would probably have to separate that and maybe put the middle school at Adams or somewhere like that. So one, it causes a huge amount of disruption in the, you know, the families that have chosen that because it's a K-8. A lot of families don't want that disruption when it comes to middle school. Um, two, it's a beautiful school. It's just beautiful. Um, and it's, it's a really special environment. The leadership there is amazing. The teachers in the school are great. We have one a volunteer who's like a grandfather who's been coming since it's open and he volunteers in the library it has a lot of community engagement and honestly sometimes 
for that community, that's the only time the students are going to have access to being on a college campus and having that experience and understanding what higher education looks like. Um, and so to see a loss of that partnership is heartbreaking, I think, for every board member and here at the district in general. Our guest, I want to remind people, is school board member Jessica Vaughn in Hillsborough County, and we're talking about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And as we wrap up, I want to talk about the election that's coming up for school board members in August. And it, one surprise is that recently your race dropped down to just you and Myosha Powell. Uh, that was kind of a surprise to, to people who have been following this race. Um, any thoughts about the fact that there's only two of you now in, in that race? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. So since it is a nonpartisan seat, um, the rules around this race are in the primary, any nonpartisan candidate can win in the primary as long as they have 50% of the vote plus one additional vote. So in elections like mine, that's nonpartisan. I mean, unless there was some miracle and voters specifically split perfectly down the middle, my election is going to be decided in the primary. Um, so we need everybody who is passionate or cares about school board races or anyone who wants their voice in democracy to be heard to make sure that they're voting and engaging in this primary election, which is on August 20th um, in 2024. Other school board elections will probably be won, even if there's three or more candidates in there. It's very likely that one candidate will get 50% plus one vote. In our last election, all three school board members won their election in the primary. And especially for our independent voters or our nonpartisan voters, it is imperative that they participate. And a lot of times they don't, because if you're nonpartisan, you're not voting in the primary. So the only thing that will be on your ballot is school board elections and soil and water. So unfortunately, a lot of times people don't see the value in that, or they think, oh, I'll vote in November. That's when I'm going to turn out. Um, and that's quite concerning. We have as low as 17% participation in the primaries. So it means that a very small amount of people are making huge decisions for our counties and electing people. So I just encourage every single person to please participate in the primary election. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming back on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Jessica. Thank you. Again, it's always been an honor. I appreciate it. I love WMNF and everything that you guys do. Community radio is so important. Um, so thanks again. Well, I'm really glad you could come on. Thank you. Jessica Vaughn is a Hillsborough County School Board member. We spoke about education issues in Florida. I'm Sean Canan. This is Tuesday Cafe broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa.